Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I don't know the password to your user on this computer, Dad, so you may have to come up here and enter that. <laughs> and while he's doing that, I just want to say uh, thanks for having me. Um, a lot of you probably um, remember some of my uh, childhood and adolescent days, and so uh, at the end of the sermon, you can decide whether letting me come preach to you was worth it or not. But I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here. Uh, right now, at my congregation um, in, in Arizona, we're going through this series that you know nothing about because it's just something that I am doing there. But it's, it's uh, looking at the connection between hymns and the scriptures that they're based off of. And the song, the song we just sang together um, almost has a complete uh, kind of model after Psalm 23. So um, it gives us a wonderful opportunity to... To sing the, the promises of God, to be comforted by them, uh, before we spend some, some time looking at the Word of God and, and hearing His promises as well. So Simba, the young heir to the throne in Disney's The Lion King, famously sang the song. You can say it with me. I just can't wait to be king. Millions of voices have sung the same words, hummed that same melody, and imagined climbing to the top of Pride Rock with visions of fame and glory. Wouldn't it be great to be the king of everything the light touches? Wouldn't it be nice if all the other animals had to bow down to me? Wouldn't it be amazing if I got to be the one in charge? Now, um, she's not much of a lion. In fact, she hardly barks more than once a month, and I promise that's a true statistic. But this is... Uh, Willow in, in my arms. <laughs> this is a picture of my wife Kaylee and I, and uh, <laughs> Kaylee brought Willow into my life as we dated, and then into my apartment when we got married. I suppose it is now technically our apartment, and Willow is technically our dog. Therefore, I have the joy of being a part of, a member of, the care team for Willow. Usually, I take her out first thing in the morning, and last thing before bedtime, and for whatever reason, and maybe I'm not alone in this, those times of the day happen to be probably my least patient moments. Like I said, Willow isn't much of a lion. I don't think she really wants to be the king or queen of anything. In fact, she's perfectly fine being the princess of the apartment. But when I take her out with that really masculine looking purple leash, maybe, you, yeah, I guess you can't really see it, but there's a purple leash. <laughs> Not to mention her 5.9 pound frame. It sort of grinds my gears a little bit when she moseys around, looking at, uh, sniffing every pebble in the landscaping, wandering this way and that. In other words, she doesn't seem to be too open to my loving leadership and protective guidance. In fact, I get this look from her from time to time. <laughs> I love this picture. <laughs> Have you ever received that look before? Maybe not from your dog, but uh, maybe from someone who questions your advice or wisdom. <laughs> Have you ever given that look before? Sometimes I wonder uh, if when we pray, God sees facial expressions, even though our eyes might be closed and um, our heads might be bowed. And I just know that if he does, he probably has gotten a few of these uh, from me from time to time. Now bear with me, I know we've already talked about lions and kings and puppies, but let me add one more animal, little animal into the mix, sheep. And depending on how loose of a definition you have of sheep, um, how loose of a mental picture you have of sheep, Willow might qualify for that category anyways. And even though Willow should know by now, I mean, I've been taking her out, watching her while the family's out of town, I'm taking care of her for years, even though she should know by now that I love her and that our relationship is founded on my care and protection for her. I'd never let anything happen to her. I still feel the leash pull a little when she wants to go another direction. I still get a little impatient with her when how, uh, with how long it takes her to do her business. Or when she, come, when she wants to walk somewhere that isn't safe. I mean, bare foot or bare paw on blacktop when it's 115 degrees out, no thanks. Yet pretty often I encounter a little resistance. But back to the sheep. 
Psalm 23 is probably the prime time passage in the Bible when it comes to our understanding of ourselves as sheep in Jesus' flock. And as Jesus later describes himself in the Gospel of John and other places, he is our good shepherd. I mean, we even have a Sunday dedicated to it, depending on what church you attend. And that picture of what it means to follow Jesus is one we teach our youngest children, one we share at tear-filled funerals and memorial services as well. It's hard to find another metaphor that seems to meet us at every turn of life. But Jesus managed to do it with the sheep and the shepherd. And explaining that metaphor, that picture, is exactly what Psalm 23 does. So let's take a little deeper look at it together. Would you read this with me? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Here is the basic, most general depiction of our relationship with Jesus. He is our shepherd. The psalm neatly places him above all things as Lord in the second word, taking for granted his cosmic authority and rulership over all things. We all know that God is God, and that God is in charge, and that God makes the rules, and God is who we will have to answer to someday. And that whatever I'd like to think about the world and my freedoms and happiness, ultimately, I will have to stand before God one day. Kind of a scary thought, but instead of fear before God himself, the psalmist describes comfort, the comfort of a caring shepherd, leading his sheep to places of rest and renewal, leading his flock down paths of righteousness, that is, paths of faithful obedience and grace, all to uphold his name. In other words, it's the heart of who God is. He guides, leads, cares for, and provides for his sheep. He loves them. And that sets us up nicely for the next couple of verses. We read, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. <laughs> well, that kind of took a turn, right? The valley of the shadow of death? Evil? What kind of shepherd would take his sheep through a place like that? And here's where we need to be careful because, frankly, sometimes we all want a God who is simply there to lead us through those quiet, grassy meadows and slow-moving streams. We want a God to make us feel better, solve our problems, but otherwise to pretty much leave us alone. If you think about it, we almost fall into a weird place where we as the sheep imagine that the shepherd is actually supposed to answer to us, that we get to be in charge, that we get to make the rules, that we know best, but that pesky second word of the psalm stands quietly there patiently there, almost as if waiting for us to read it again, Lord. You know, as churchy people, we like the word Lord. It's almost exclusive to us. So we get to sort of choose what it means and when. But a better way to communicate the point might be to say king. The king. No one makes the rules except the king. No one calls the shots except the king. Certainly not the sheep. There's something special about this king, though. He isn't just an angry, distant, threatening king who is waiting for us to mess up. And he isn't just a quiet, timid king waiting for us to call on him for some relief and therapy, either. He is an intimately involved, overwhelmingly close, personally invested king. He's a companion. He's a caretaker, a provider, a loving father. In other words, a shepherd. And when we remember who the shepherd is, and that under the hood of his shepherd's robe, he wears a crown, those protests about the valleys and the shadows, those fears of what evil may come our way, start to evaporate. Why? 
Because if the shepherd king leads me in paths of righteousness, then even the dark and scary places, the tragedies, the heartbreak, the hurt and pain-filled confusion, even those valleys and the reality of death itself are entered into by the flock of sheep with the shepherd right beside them. A a theologian named Derek Kidner kind of puts it this way. The dark valley or the ravine is as truly one of his right paths as are the green pastures. A fact that takes much of the sting out of any ordeal. And his presence overcomes the worst thing that remains. The fear. Here is the great comfort of the psalm. Here is the joy of knowing the king. He is always with you. And like my little puppy Willow, I pull against his guidance. I struggle and dawdle and mosey around, and he patiently waits, quietly calling my name, patiently and persistently saying, John, come back. Trust me. I'm with you. And when we hear that voice and when we say in our hearts, God, I'm so sorry. Lead me back to your paths. He smiles and says, Let's go together. After all, the shepherd isn't leading us anywhere he hasn't already been. Those valleys of sorrow and pain he is quite familiar with. The shadow of death itself fell upon his face as the darkness of his tomb enveloped his cold body buried within it. But instead of that being the end of the story, God raised him from the dead, promising forgiveness and life with him forever. And the comfort we feel from the protective shepherd, even in life's darkest valley, doesn't just lead us there and leave us. It isn't a quick hug and a finger pointing down a long and winding path to walk down on our own. In fact, the picture is far from being finished. Would you read this with me? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you're anything like me, you read the table verse and the overflowing cup verse, and you're not exactly sure where it's taking you. You get a little bit nervous about whether this will be one of those passages you sort of avoid down the road because it's confusing. And then it finishes strong with, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And you breathe a sigh of relief. But let's not skip over the beauty in that second to last verse. Take note of these three details. A feast prepared, a person anointed ceremoniously, and an overflowing cup, all well in the presence of enemies. What is this a picture of? Some strange ritual before an ensuing battle or a struggle of combat? No, it's, it's a victory feast. Historically, when the battle was won, if any of the enemies were left alive, they would be rounded up, bound, and have to watch while the winners celebrated the victory. What were the spoils of war in the psalm? Not gold or weapons, not cities or castles, but goodness and mercy. This is who our shepherd is. This is our king of love. You might be asking, John, I followed you up till here, but a battlefield, a victory feast, aren't we just a flock of sheep? Typically, I'd be right there with you, but don't forget how this story started. The king, the Lord, mentioned by name, and later the protection of the rod and staff, the dangerous valleys. Conflict has been present this whole time. And we start to see the reflection of our own lived experience. How our days often contain some variety of serene moments and intense pressure. On the one hand, the psalm is relatable because that is how life is. And on the other hand, It reminds us of something crucial to our faith. God is the one who goes to battle for us. It's true. The sheep would be about as useful in battle as the kids pushing their feet on the seat backs while you're driving the minivan up a hill. But the battle is won. 
And the table is set. The king has conquered and now freely gives the winnings away. His kindness and his love, his patient mercy, his eternal intimate presence. We close with the comforting eternal home. A place in the king's palace made especially, specifically for us. And this picture is not only one we have to abstractly look forward to or remember in some distant spiritual way, but our conquering king and comforting shepherd invites us into a sustained relationship with him, a life marked by his regular, persistent, patient, and even tangible interruption. And the feast he has set isn't only waiting for us in heaven, but he gives us, gives it to us here. On this altar to strengthen, forgive, and sustain us as his flock. A taste of the victory feast to come. Simba might have been a good shepherd king himself. I'm not sure. I can't say that I remember seeing more than one or two of those movies anyways. But what would be good for him to keep in mind, and for us to hold tightly to as well, is that sometimes it's better to know the king than to be the king. For Willow, being led on the little purple leash is a small price to pay for our care and protection, and we just love her to bits. If I can feel that way about a little dog that weighs less than a coffee maker, well, imagine just how much more love that your shepherd, your king, has stored up and overflows for you. In Jesus' name, amen.